بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most gracious most merciful Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin all praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of the worlds. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al wal mursaleen, nabiyyina wa habibina wa imamina Muhammad ibn Abdullahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We send complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all of them, without exception. And upon all his companions, without exception. May Allah bless them all and bless every single one of us. May Allah bless our offspring, those to come up to the end. My brothers and sisters, we have been blessed. We have been blessed with a beautiful faith. And that faith is the faith of Islam. It is not just a set of beliefs, but it comes with an entire way of life. And if we were to follow it correctly, we would realize that our lives would be so, so content. We would be so happy in life. It would be flowing in such a beautiful way. Because when goodness happens to us, we relate it to Allah. It does not make us arrogant. It does not make us proud in the wrong sense. And when something bad happens to us, we are patient, we relate it to Allah, we try, we may be struggling because we are human beings, but the fact that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us going. And when it keeps us going, subhanallah, it brings us closer to Allah. Every one of us would agree that when we have difficulties in our lives, we become closer to Allah. There's no doubt. We know of times when you are sick, when you are ill, when you are expecting, when you have a pain in your legs, when something's about to happen, you've suffered financially, someone has suffered in your home, perhaps divorce, whatever else it may be, we tend to soften up at a certain point. And we tend to start calling out to Allah. We tend to start making promises to Allah. So it's one of the ways that Allah brings us closer to Him. This is why He says, through the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا أَحَبَّ عَبْدًا إِبْتَلَهُ When Allah loves His slave, when Allah loves a particular person, He then tests them. And the more He loves you, the more He tests you. Because He brings you closer and closer to Him through that test. Some people don't have children. May Allah bless them with children. But as they pass through the years, Allah alone knows whether he is going to give you the children or not. But your duty, because you don't know, your duty is to keep on asking. And as you keep on asking, you will notice you soften up for Allah. You might start the medical route, you might start various other routes, and then you soften up for Allah, and it brings you closer to Him. So, you might wonder why I started this talk in this particular way. I was asked to speak about a verse of the Qur'an, a few verses of the Qur'an, related to the importance of investigation and authentication when it comes to news, number one. Number two is to concentrate on issues related to spying, related to false accusation, slander, and related to backbiting. Did you hear what I just said? So I started in this particular way because every one of us here, we may be the victims of some of these crimes perpetrated by others against us. This is a different angle altogether. People normally tell you, don't backbite, don't eavesdrop, don't slander, meaning false accusation. Or you must authenticate before you hear some information. I started off the other way around to say, if someone has backbitten about you, someone has spied on you, someone has slandered you, someone has believed something about you without authenticating it, then what? Number one, inshallah, your sabr and your patience will definitely be a means of your entry into Jannah. Remember that. 
Someone lied about you that you are perhaps an evil person and you are not an evil person. What can you do about it? Very little, especially with social media today. Even WhatsApp is enough to cause the damage. This is why to spread messages today is far more dangerous than it was a long time ago. Because a long time ago, if I spread a message, it would move to 20 people in 20 days. Today, it will move to 2 million people in 2 days. You see what I'm saying? So we need to be even more careful. It is so tempting to be the first one to carry the tail today. So we are quick to put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram, say something about it. Why? Someone forwarded it and we sent it and it was a lie. It was a lie. And the people who believed it will not be receiving the message that you might send later on saying it was a lie. So that gives us indication that it is even more important to make sure before you forward something. I remember receiving so many different types of messages and I look at it and I say this is a lie and I, I'm just shocked at the type of people who send it to me sometimes. Subhanallah. There was one message that was very popular about the, the, the moon doing tawaf around the Kaaba. Have you come across that one? Trust me, it was a tale to laugh at the Muslims. That's all. And the Muslims at that time, I've seen people, hey, wake up, that's the moon, the moon. <laughs> the moon making tawaf around the Kaaba, what a joke. That doesn't happen. It hasn't happened. No, it didn't. The most that scientifically does happen is at a certain time of the year, the moon is, sorry, the sun is directly above the Kaaba. That's correct. So if you want to see the Qibla, you walk out and you see which direction the sun is and it will be in that direction. I have seen it with my own eyes and it is generally the direction that we do know. Well, that's because the sun is right above the Kaaba at that particular moment. They give you a time. But to tell me the moon is making tawaf around the Kaaba, make special dua, and then we throw in, we say, this is a dua of Mufti Mink. I don't know if you've seen that one there. To make it sound like it's true, you just throw in something. Be careful. We are living in an age of video shopping, photo shopping, editing, you know, cut and paste. We're living in an age of real difficulty, hardship in that sense. It's become so hard to distinguish between right and wrong for those who are trigger happy, those who just stay on their phones and just click 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 and they read everything believe everything forward everything wait when you start forwarding things that are not authentic what will happen you start losing value for that which is authentic because it doesn't sound as juicy when someone wants to tell you a lie they have to add some juice to it you know they have to add some marination to it they have to add some chilies to it right to let it become a little bit tasty okay so they will add so much to it. When you are used to those type of tales, you won't want the plain truth, just like that. So, if someone has lied about you, you need to go back and seek comfort in the stories of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They lied about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if they lied about him, they will definitely lie about you and me, you and I. They said he was a madman. They will say you are a madman. They said he was a liar, a cheater, kathab. They called him kathab. They called him a poet. They said he's just a poet and he's coming with powerful poetry. They accused him of being a magician, a sorcerer. Many of us are accused of being people who've done black magic on people whom we don't even know. I know in a lot of cases, you see, when people deal with black magic, what happens is... You have an imam who does ruqya and so on. And after a while, sometimes if there is a jinn or if there is some form of effect of it, sometimes the jinn begins to speak. Okay? It happens. And that jinn would speak in, with the voice of that particular person or the voice of anyone else. And the imam or the sheikh would ask the jinn, Why are you here? Listen, some of you might have seen this. So the jinn will say, I am here because so and so sent me to kill this person. I don't know if you've ever heard this, okay? So what, what happens is, they don't realize the jinn is lying. The jinn is telling you a lie. And in your case, you've just believed a jinn. 
So what I have done, for example, is say, you are lying. And then the jinn changes the story to say, no, I was sent by such and such a person, another family member. It's usually a family member because the job of shaitan is to destroy your family. Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah speaks about what the shaitan does. And one of the primary aims is to destroy the relation between husband and wife and to break up families in that particular way. So they say, your mother-in-law did this, your sister-in-law did that. Normally they pick on the women. And normally what they do, they say a name of a person whom you might have had a difference with. It's normal in an extended home to have differences among yourselves. It's normal. It's absolutely normal. If you've got more than a few brothers and sisters and more than a few relatives, if you do not have some differences with some of them, you're not normal. So it's absolutely normal. Now if some, someone with a big beard comes to you and says, you know that brother is jealous of you, so he sent a shaitan to destroy you, that's it. In your mind it's a fact, but wallahi it's a lie. Wallahi, it's a lie. Maybe he doesn't like you. Maybe you had a difference. But wallahi, they did not do anything against you. This is shaitan that's harming you, affecting you, making you want to destroy your home. Find out, authenticate. Like I said, if the jinn is told you are lying, it brings a second name. If it's told you are still lying, it brings a third name. Proving that everything is a lie. You cannot believe shaitan. Imagine something is stolen. You catch the thief and the thief starts telling you another story. I'm not the thief, but I saw you. You are the thief. And then the thief starts taking names of others. No way. I won't believe anything. Whoever sent you and whatever, you are the one who stole. You are the one who is here. Get out or we punish you. Bring back whatever you've stolen and so on. So if you have saved someone or you have been saved from the effect of a jinn or shaitan, that should be good enough. Do not pursue who did it and why they did it because it's wrong. It's always wrong. It's always a lie. No matter what. They can say, but that lady, she goes out to the magicians and I know she's very bad and she's evil. She keeps on going. Don't say that. That's shaitan entrapping you further. That's the trap. Do you think when he leaves, he's going to leave your house in order? No way. He's going to want to break it even further. Remember that. He's going to want to break it further. So he will lie to you again and again. Such a way that when he's gone, your family is broken forever. I know brothers and sisters who don't speak to each other for 20 years. Based on what someone with a beard told them, was magic done by someone else. Why? Why break someone's home? It was a lie. Who did you believe? You could never have known the unseen. In order to know what happened, you need Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam to have come to you with information. And I'm sorry, that has stopped because it's called revelation. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there was a Jewish young man known as Labid ibn al-Asam al-Yahudi. He took some of the hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he tried to bewitch him. And the, the effect lasted a while, more than a month approximately. And... The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are clear narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, in so many other books of hadith that make mention of the fact that one day as he was lying down, the two angels came to him, one at his feet and one at his head. And the one is asking the other, what happened? So they said, matboobun, that means someone has tried to bewitch him. So who is it? Then the other one says, it is Labid ibn al-A'asam al-Yahudi. What did he do? Who's talking? The angels are talking, not shaitan. What did he do? Well, he, he put knots on a comb. He tied them, 11 of them, blew in them and put them under the rock, under a certain well. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is to get it, to untie those knots. With each untying of the knot, one of the verses of the last two surahs of the Quran was revealed. Hence, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ The two combined have 11 verses. The most powerful in terms of protection from shaitan, from the jinn, the last two surahs of the Quran. So how did he know? Revelation. So when someone else tells you about it, you ask them, did Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam come to you? If the answer is no, Discount what they have said. That's it. Discount it. They are, they are causing havoc in your home. They are causing havoc in your relationship. And all this will be accusation for no reason. Unfair accusation. 
So my brothers and sisters, when something like this happens to someone where people have accused you, say for example, of anything, go back and read these stories and you will find out Aisha radiallahu anha was accused as well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was accused of being a womanizer. He was accused of being a person running behind wealth. But he was a religious man. He was a Nabi of Allah. He was the best of creation without a doubt. And yet he was accused. Why was he accused? So that we who came later on could learn that there are really some bad people who like to accuse others. Are you one of them? I'd like to hope not. Don't accuse others. If you have accused others of what they are not guilty of, you have joined the ranks of those who caused harm to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those who are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who accuse the believing women and men of that which they are not guilty of, have indeed burdened themselves with a great burden. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَا اكْتَسَبُوا فَقَدْ احْتَمَلُوا بُهْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِينًا Surah Al-Ahzab, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who have harmed the believing women and men with that which they are not guilty of at all. They have engaged in a big slander. Buhtanan. Buhtan means a slander. And ithmam mubinan means a clear cut sin. It is sinful. Don't do that. So there are two sides to this. One is to be accused. And the other is to accuse. To accuse is a major, major sin. And to be accused, you will need to bear sabr. You need to bear patience. You might want to do something about it within limits. Don't react in a way that makes the problem even bigger. Sometimes we react in a way that we become even more depressed. You know, nowadays, the age of social media and the way it's become, the age of the internet, if someone swears you online, your best bet is to ignore it. The minute you respond, you have made them popular. You have made that swearing be known to people who wouldn't have known it had you not replied. So you need to think carefully before you do things. If you have been affected, don't just respond like everyone says, hey, you know, just tell them, just answer them. Think about it. Sometimes just be quiet, say a dua, block that person maybe, depending on what they've said. Ignore them. See whether it carries on or not. And you will have to bear patience with every droplet of patience your rank is increasing in the eyes of Allah. Look at Aisha radiallahu anha. She was the purest of the pure of women. She was the wife of the Prophet sallallahu the daughter of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha, a person whom a lot of the deen has been brought to us through. That's who she is. And you know what happened? The hypocrites wanted to find fault in her, so they accused her of adultery. They accused her of adultery. In today's terms, they accused her of having an affair. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let that proceed, let that pass for a while. He didn't respond to it immediately. Why? Because he wanted the categories of people to be clear. Here is the tale. Do you believe it? That's what Allah wanted to see. So the tale was created by a man known as Abdullah ibn, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And it was spread by people. One of them who spread the tale was a person known as Mr. ibn Athatha. Radiallahu an. He made a mistake. He spread the tale and there were a few others. The person they were claiming was having an affair was a man known as Safwan ibn Mu'attal. Radiallahu anhu. A very good man. Also known by Rasulullah sallallahu as a very honest man, really good. He used to come to the house now and again. And the person he was accused with was Aisha radiallahu anha. What was the statement? These two having an affair. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after a period of time, decided to reveal verses to say, those who created the tale shall be served a severe punishment. You create a tale, you have a severe punishment. 
Those who spread it. Now, no, not those who created it. Those who forwarded it. Those who spread it. They will have a share of the sin. And they will be punished accordingly. According to the share of their sin. You know, they are now shareholders in the crime. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The winners are those whom, when they heard it, they said, This is nonsense, we don't want to hear it, and I don't believe it. Go away. My brothers and sisters, for you and I, the best thing is, just say, I don't believe it, I don't want to hear it, and throw it out. The problem with us today, you see a man walking with a woman, you don't even know what's the relation, and you start saying, they're having an affair. We do it, don't we? You see a married man and suddenly he's speaking to another woman, maybe she's married as well to someone else, and the two are just talking about something, maybe they might have just pa crossed paths or whatever has happened, and suddenly the two are having an affair. What happened? You join the ranks of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He's the one who created the tale, and Allah says he will have a severe punishment. Be careful, watch out, authenticate. You know, the age of WhatsApp, we need to be careful how we use our phones. Do you know why? We use emoticons without really meaning them. Do you know that? You know what's an emoticon? I'm sure you do, right? So now you have this heart that comes about. And you have these roses and flowers, the tulips and everything else. And you have little abbreviations for I love you or for perhaps other things I miss you and whatnot. And people say it without meaning it. People send the heart, ten hearts. And they send, I love yous. Love you, bye. What do you mean, love you, bye? Is that like a way of saying, Salaamu Alaikum? You rather use the Salaamu Alaikum, it's much more honorable, you receive a reward. But that's the way some people just say, goodbye. They say, love you, bye. They don't mean, I love you. There's a difference, you know. One is with Tajweed and one is without. <laughs> so, sometimes you pick up that phone and you see, <clears throat> having an affair. Straight away, people think, wow. But you don't know that's an honorable person on the other side. It's maybe their culture. It's maybe their style. It's, it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. But don't jump to conclusions. It's dangerous. You will break your marriage. You break your home. You destroy relations out of something that could be solved within five minutes. Be careful. Not every message you see that sounds dirty is actually indicative of a dirty relationship. It is wrong. I'm not saying it's right. Don't get me wrong. It is wrong to have that message. But it does not mean there is something deeper unless you have strict, clear-cut evidence in that regard. That's why we say, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe. That's our theme. Before I even carry on, let me tell you, if you are a true believer, Every time Allah says, Oh, you who believe, you want to hear, Hey, what did he say? Do you know that? Because you consider yourself one of those who are being addressed. That's why. So if Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, and you're not bothered, something's wrong with your iman. Imagine if you're a bank manager, and I say, Oh, bank manager, and you say, Yeah, what? It means you're the bank manager, isn't it? But if you're the bank manager, and I say, Oh, bank manager, and you... Walking the other way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I've given you one silly example, but the example at hand is far greater and higher. Oh, you who believe, are you really believers? Well, then you will say, What? Tell us. We really want to know. Ya amanu. What does Allah say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Al Hujurat. That surah, the whole surah, you must read it. Please read it. It has in it what is more important than the United Nations Charter. It's a surah speaking about relationships, what you should do, how you should treat each other, the men, the women, how you should look at each other, don't spy, don't eavesdrop, don't backbite and so on. All these things are made mention of in one short surah. So Allah says, when a person comes to you with information, the term used is fasiqun. Someone who is sinful has come to you with information about another. How do I know he's sinful? 
I tell you there are two or three different explanations, but I love the one explanation that is perhaps the best that I have seen where the fact that he has come to you with a tale about someone else already means he's sinful because he's backbiting. There you are. Did you hear that? The fact that he has come to you with a tale about someone else, he's already sinful because he's backbiting. If he was a proper believer, he wouldn't have come to you with a tale. He would have only gone to those who can rectify the problem. That's what Islam teaches. If I see a person drinking alcohol, if I go around talking about them, I have taken their sin on my shoulders. That's what happens. But if I message the brother, brother, you know, I saw you today. Mashallah, I was so glad to see you, but I think that might have been a bottle in your hand. You know, my brother, I'm just letting you know, I, I have weaknesses, you have weaknesses, but try and give this up for the sake of Allah. You know, it's haram, it's a major sin. You have a concern. He might not like you, but you did the right thing. You told him, hey, look, don't do this. You did not go to the dunya, to the whole world and spread the tale. Or you might want to go to someone in authority over a child. You saw a child in a nightclub. Well, what were you doing there? Sorry. But anyway, you saw the child in the nightclub and you went out and you said, Hey, I'm going to your dad and I'm telling your dad, I saw your daughter in the nightclub, for example. That's not wrong because you want to help them to stop them from doing that again. So first you might want to try with the child. Say, listen, if you're not going to quit, I'm going to have to tell your dad. That's a good step to start with, right? And they say, no, 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 I won't do it again. Thank you. Don't do it again. They might tell you, but uncle, what are you doing in the same nightclub? That's a question you're going to have to answer later on, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> you, <laughs> at the same time, if that doesn't solve the problem, and you happen to see this happening again and again, for, somehow, I don't know how, I'm just having a good heart, you know, to think that you did it the right way. And you saw it again, you might want to take it up further. So you will take it up further. What will you do? You then speak to the parents maybe. Or to a brother, elder brother. Hey look, I saw your sister. And I saw her in the nightclub. And you know what? She was knocked out. Knocked out meaning perhaps drunk or whatever else. But you did not put it on Twitter. Hey, guess who I saw today in the club? Wow. That's what the dunya is doing today. Send a WhatsApp message on your group. Astaghfirullah. This sister was in the nightclub. This brother was drinking alcohol. Are you a true believer? If you are, and you are a true believer who is concerned about Allah and Rasulullah and the Ummah, you will want to solve the problem, not to spread it. That's the thing. You want to resolve it. So I saw you doing bad. I went out and I tried to resolve. The fact that I'm going to someone with a tale about someone else, with story, with information, I already know this person is sinful. That's what it is. Now this Naba is referring to news and information about someone else. That is negative. How do I know that? Because of the rest of the verse. Allah says, when a sinful person comes to you with information about someone else, فَتَبَيَّنُوا Make sure you authenticate thoroughly before you believe it. In another qira'ah, qira'ah meaning riwayah of recitation, فَتَثَبَّتُوا It means the same thing. Authenticate. Make sure that you verify the information thoroughly before you believe it. Why? Allah says, because you might just fall in the following sin. You might fall into the following sin. What is the sin? Because you might just wrongly accuse some people of something and then regret it later. You have wrongly believed something about people and then you regret it later. Why did that happen? Because someone came to you with information and you did not verify it. That's why. So when someone comes to you with a tale, no matter what the tale is, authenticate it. Firstly, ask yourself, does it concern me? If it doesn't, well, make dua for that person perhaps. Tell them sometimes, keep quiet. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want, I don't believe it. How can you not believe it? I am telling you. I don't believe it. It's over. And I don't need to believe it. And I don't want to know it. It's better for you to make a mistake thinking that someone is good 
than to make a mistake and think that they are bad. That is called husnul dhan in Islam. Husnul dhan means to have a good feeling about someone, to have give them the benefit of the doubt 70 times. You see someone, for example, you know, it's the height of it. You see someone, for example, walking on the street towards, say, a nightclub. I'm going to give you these little examples. They're coming to my mind right now. So, say you see someone walking towards a nightclub and you drove past. Believe in your mind that they might be walking to the masjid, which is just half a kilometer away. They were only passing there. Wallahi. It's, if you are making a mistake, it's better to make a mistake believing them to have done a good thing than to make a mistake believing them to have done something that was bad and they didn't. You see someone walking into the club, think to yourself, inshallah, they're going inside to get someone out. Allahu Akbar. That was the uncle who we spoke about a few minutes ago. Okay. So this is called husnul dhan. When things go missing in our houses, a lot of us who might have helping hands, the first doubt, I, I think the maid must have taken this. First thing, my earrings, I'm sure they went missing. My sister, you put them somewhere so safe that even you don't know where it is. I promise you. And you know what? You're accusing someone. Keep quiet. Did you see evidence? No, you didn't. Stop saying that. It's a major, major sin. Stop it. You accuse people of things and wallahi, the list can go on and on and on and on. But do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the same surah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا Allahu Akbar. You know what that means? Do not spy on each other. Don't spy. Some people enjoy spying. I want to spy. Don't spy on your husband, on your wife, on your parents, on your children, perhaps on anyone else. Don't spy. Not spying, no. Not at all. One might say, but I'm, I'm allowed, it's my right. What right? I tell you what. Say for example, someone is doing something wrong, okay? And you start spying. You might get such a big shock that you won't be able to forgive them. But the sin was not committed against you, it was committed against Allah. People say, you know, my husband cheated on me. I say, no, he cheated on Allah. He cheated on Allah. He might promise you things. That doesn't mean anything. Let him promise Allah. People don't understand what I said sometimes. My husband cheated on me. That's what they say. My wife cheated on me. For example, people say these things. Hang on. Before that, they cheated on Allah. The covenant was with Allah. But I tell you what, I have known of cases, and I'm going to tell you a fact, of people who have cheated. They come for help. And they say, I cheated. It lasted a while. I regret it. I made tawbah. Please help me. I want to know what to do. They come out of it. They get closer to their spouses than they ever were. The spouse doesn't know anything. The spouse does not know what happened. This happened and they became stronger in relation with the spouse. Are you listening? So strong. The bond is powerful. The spouse doesn't have a clue that 10 years ago there was something that happened here. It lasted six months. It was very bad. But guess what? They turned Allah forgave them. Allah had mercy on them. Allah helped the relationship grow because Allah is Ghafoorul Rahim. Had you spied on him, the family would have been broken to pieces. You are not Ghafoorul Rahim. You will not be able to forgive the person. So Allah says, don't spy. Leave it to us. We will bring that man back. We will bring him back and inshallah, we will make him from among those who are the best to his wife. But he went through a problematic issue. There you are. How many people have sacrificed in their marital lives in a way that when they come out of the problem they were in, they are closer than they ever were in the past. It has happened to a lot, maybe the majority, in different levels, on different levels. But for those who want to set traps and put, you know what? The world is filled with sin. Can anyone here tell me they have not sinned? Put up your hand. Put it up high. If you have never committed a sin, Put up your hands. Nobody, not one. You know why? 
كل بني آدم خطاء everyone children of Adam human beings sinful commit sin خطاء doesn't mean a person who committed one sin خطاء means they commit sins but Allah says وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ the best of those who commit sins are those who constantly repent may Allah forgive us keep on repeating may Allah forgive us may Allah forgive us astaghfirullah astaghfirullah may Allah forgive me repeat it morning afternoon evening night when you are going driving walking at work every little while astaghfirullah oh Allah forgive me say it in your language sometimes it's more powerful it will hit your mind what you are saying oh Allah forgive me I've done wrong in my life forgive me oh Allah forgive me repeat it because one day you will die if you get used to repeating it every day the day you die you would have already said it on that day So, a person who is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, as soon as they sin, they will what? Turn back to Allah. You know what Allah says in the Quran? وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ Those who have committed immorality, here speaking about sins, adultery, fornication, etc. They were not caught. They, were, they didn't do it in public. They didn't have any witnesses against them. It was private. They did it secretly. No one knows. They know Allah knows. Perhaps the person they committed the crime with knows. That's it. No one else knows. Allah covered them. Allah hid them. You know what Allah says? Those people who committed such sin of immorality and oppressed themselves, if they remember Allah and seek forgiveness for that sin, Allah will forgive them. And you know what Allah says? Allah will forgive them. And on top of that, Allah says, Allah will grant them Jannah. Allah will grant them Jannah. Subhanallah. You and I, we don't forgive for a sin committed. Allah says, I will give that person Jannah as a result. If they've repented. The reason I say this, it goes back to spying. Spying, why is it prohibited? It's prohibited because who are you to pry into the lives of others whose answerability lies with Allah, not with you? That's what it is. Their answerability lies with Allah, not with you. Yes, if they are usurping your rights, then you have the right to say, listen, my rights are usurped. You're not giving me this and this and this, or you are not fulfilling my rights. They might tell you, well, you are not fulfilling my rights. Let's talk about it. It's my right. It's your right. But if it's a right of Allah, hang on, hang on, stop spying. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It doesn't end there. People get a joy, excitement. You know, sometimes you have pornography, which is a crime. It's terrible, it's horrible, it's something unacceptable. It has an impact, it impacts society at large. But do you know what? Sometimes, in today's world, I have come across people who habitually forward dirty messages to their friends because morality has been degrading. And suddenly there are these wrong images. I'm not saying it's right. Wrong little video clips. Dirty ones. And they begin to forward them. Number one, you are getting a major sin to have forwarded it. Number two, you are getting a major sin to have downloaded it or seen it or perhaps seen the whole of it for example you know someone might have sent you something you don't know what it is you downloaded it as soon as you see it's nonsense astaghfirullah turn it off you, you, you know what you know the astaghfirullah needs to be genuine it must not be a fake astaghfirullah you know what's a fake astaghfirullah do you want to hear about it they say there was a man and this is actually a true story it happened I won't mention the city or the place there was a man, mashallah, he came, a bearded man, you know, and he came for some purpose to a city where he was not used to it. He comes from a city that was quite strict, you know. The women dressed very modestly in his city. So when he entered this one city where everyone's semi-naked and nude, you know, showing whatever they have. So he sees these legs and astaghfirullah, he looks away, you know, loudly. So the hosts are driving the car. They are wondering, what's he saying so loudly, astaghfirullah. He says, no, there was a woman there, you know, astaghfirullah, the way she was dressed, you know. Astaghfirullah. And after a little while, astaghfirullah again. After, astaghfirullah. And he kept on doing that the whole day. These people, they got used to it. Okay, whenever he sees this woman who is not dressed properly, he just says astaghfirullah and he looks away. That happened the first day. It happened the next day. It happened the second day. Whole day. So third day, what happens is, the man is in the car 
and he's driving. So the driver, they got used to it. The driver saw something like that as well. So he says, Astaghfirullah. So the Shaykh says, Wait, wait. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah forgive us. Where is Astaghfirullah? So when you delete things, you say Astaghfirullah, you must be genuine. You must be genuine. I say Astaghfirullah because I mean, Oh Allah, forgive me. That's what it's supposed to be. It's, it, it's not that... It's not that I'm just saying it for the sake of it. No, I mean, I mean it genuinely. So we delete those things. But if you see such a message in the phone, for example, of your spouse, investigate. Investigate, meaning, you know what? Don't jump to a conclusion. You could just break things. I'm not saying it's right. It's bad. It's wrong. It's very wrong. But at the same time, are you there to help or are you there to pick on someone? That's the question you need to ask. Are you there to help or are you there to pick some pick on them? If you are there to pick on them, you can pick on them now, even without that. Pick on anything. I don't like the way you talk. I don't like the way you look. I don't like your nose, your teeth also, even your tongue. I don't like it. You can pick on anything, your toes, whatever else. But if you're really there to help, you will be able to assist. Look, this is terrible. We don't want this to happen again, inshallah. You know, don't have friends like those. Tell your friends that, look, I don't want messages of this nature, whatever else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us help, guidance and assistance. Regarding the sin of backbiting, you and I need to know that backbiting has been interpreted in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many of us, when we are told, brother stop backbiting, what's the first thing we say? But it's true, isn't it? We say, but it's true. You say, you know, the sister was so bad, she was like this, she was talking like this, she was arrogant, she was, we're talking about a sister. Someone says, brother, stop backbiting. But it's true, what I'm saying is true. Well, I want to tell you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if it is true, then that is backbiting. Because if it is a lie, then it goes under the term slander. One is ghiba. Ghiba means backbiting. And one is buhtan. Buhtan means fabrication. Of a lie. It's a lie and it's backbiting on top of that. So it makes it a slander. So what is the sin of backbiting? The hadith says, Dhikruka akhaka bima yakrah. To mention about your brother or your sister that which he or she would dislike if they were there. So I'm talking behind someone's back about something they would not like if they were there. That is ghiba. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what if what we are saying is true? So he said, if what you are saying is true, then that is backbiting. And if what you are saying is false, then that is buhtan, it is even worse. So Allah says, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا don't backbite each other. Don't talk bad about each other. I want to present a challenge to all of you this morning. What is the challenge? When you talk about others behind their backs, only say nice things. Are you ready for that challenge? Very few people said yes. Did you hear that? When you talk behind the backs of your mother-in-law, only say nice things. Okay? Nobody said yes. Did you hear that? Allah <laughs> mustan. Astaghfirullah. When you talk behind anyone's back, only say good things. Wallahi, your spirituality will increase. Your closeness to Allah will increase. Someone says, the sister says, yeah, mashallah, she's so good, alhamdulillah. You know, I've only known, well, you don't have to lie to say I've only known good things about her. But you can say, mashallah, she has a lot of good qualities, alhamdulillah. You know, she's a really good person and alhamdulillah. Yes, if someone wants to do business with someone or get married to someone or engage in a deal with someone, then the issue of backbiting drops. It drops. So someone wants to marry someone and they say, Please tell us, how is this person? No, very good, mashallah. And you know that they are drunkards. They are on drugs. They are liars. They have illegitimate children. For example, you have to say, look, my brother, this is only amana between us. I have to say it because I have been requested. It's not backbiting. Why? Because this is bearing witness. 
It's like when you go to the court and the judge tells you, right, what did this man do? You say, look, I know he stole, but I can't say it because it'll be backbiting. Like, come on. Or people don't want to report to the police because they say, if I go to the police, I'm reporting behind his back, isn't it? I don't need, that's not wrong. You need to know the limits of it. To get your right, you're allowed to say anything. لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم. Allah says Allah does not like that you speak bad, except if you are oppressed yourself. You stole my money. I need to tell people, hey, this man stole my money because I want the money back. Number one, and I don't want others to be bitten with the same man. That's not backbiting. You need to know this. But I just go out general and sundry to everyone and I start saying things. This is a bad man. He steals people's money. No, he doesn't steal people's money. He had a problem with me and he didn't pay me my money or he stole my money, etc. You explain exactly what it was your side. It's up to them to go to him and get his side before they deal with him. So for example, someone wants to marry a person. They say, look, we want to get married here. What do you know of the person? And you say, well, I... I'm letting you know, Amana, Amana, that this person has a weakness of drugs. Wallahi, in fact, if you lie about that and you know it, you are sinful. Because you are dooming someone else's daughter. Imagine your daughter, your sister, or you, if you're not married, you want to marry someone and you ask people who know that he's on drugs, how is this man? And they say, very good man. And they know. That's a major sin. That's called bearing false witness. That's called shahada to zur. The Prophet ﷺ has warned about bearing false witness. You are being asked to bear witness about someone. You are not being asked to backbite about them. There's a difference between the two. There is a need for you to get up and to say things. Someone says, look, I'm about to do a million dollar deal with this man. He is your neighbor. What do you have to say? Is he a decent man that I can do the deal with? Either you say, don't do the deal and you stop there. Or you say, don't do the deal because... We have, five people have had a problem, he's taken their money. Jazakallah khair. You will be rewarded for having saved me from that. That's not backbiting. Remember this. That is bearing witness. So don't lie and don't bear false witness. Don't say he's a good man. And don't be shy. Well, I know of some cases where I have told people, why did you say that he was a good boy when you knew he wasn't a good boy? Do you know what they said? They said, well, we thought maybe Allah will give him a good wife. How can you say that? If that was your daughter, you are dooming them to living with a guy who has bad habits and qualities that you know about. You can say the guy was on drugs. That's the last we know. He might have quit. You can find out. It's up to them to go to others and to ask again and again. Sometimes they might be satisfied. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding between the two here. So this is the difference between bearing witness about someone and the diff and backbiting about them. Backbiting, I have no purpose. I'm just talking bad about them. There's nothing, I'm, there's no achievement. I just want to do them down in the eyes of the people. So I stand up in the public or I mention to people, hey, you know, this person is like that and like this. So much so that even if you speak about their qualities behind them, it's called backbiting. You know, that sister, she's a bit fat, huh? That's backbiting. Did you know that? Did you know that? It's serious. It is very serious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. A lot of us, the speaker included, we need to become more conscious about this issue. We need to become more conscious about this issue. That's why I say, try your best to say good things about others. Try your best to say good things about others behind them. Let's move on to the last part of this talk. We spoke about spying and backbiting. We touched a little bit about slander. I told you the difference between backbiting and slander is one is to speak the truth. That's backbiting behind someone's back. You are saying the truth behind someone's back without it being the bearing of witness, then that's backbiting. But if you have lied about them, then that is a slander. A slander is so terrible that when Aisha radiallahu anha said a statement about Safiya binti Huyayya radiallahu anha about how short she was, 
She just said, hey, she's quite short. You know, some people are short and tall. And it depends. That's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To say it in, in a nice way. Wow, she's tall. You know, mashallah. You know, that's something else. And some people might, you know, like being short. For example, say, oh, she's short. Alhamdulillah. You know, she looks so cute or whatever else. That's something else. But to say, she's short. You know, you know what that means. The Prophet sallallahu says, Wallahi. If that statement in the form of a droplet was put into the ocean, it would change the color of the whole ocean. That's only to say someone was short. What about when we speak really, real bad things? And that is the truth. What about if it was a lie? Imagine. The Quran says, Would you like? Would any one of you like to eat the carrion, which is the flesh of his dead brother? And everyone just likes that. Eating the flesh of his dead brother is equivalent to backbiting, meaning speaking the truth about someone behind their back in a way that if they were there, they wouldn't like it. What if it was a lie? It's even worse than that. It's worse than eating the dead animal. It's not eating a dead animal, eating a dead human being. It's worse than that. And this is why if you read Surah An-Nur, you will come to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed spoken about the story of Aisha radiallahu anha. He cleansed her name. He cleansed her name from seven heavens. And she always used to say, I am the one whom Allah has declared my chastity from the seven heavens. This is why Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah believes that those who accuse Aisha radiallahu anha and those who accuse Aisha radiallahu anha of immorality after the Quran was revealed to clear her name, they cannot claim to be the followers of the faith of Islam because they have negated the verses of the Quran. And to negate the verse of the Quran, you are not a submitter. Islam means, or a Muslim means one who submits. Islam also means submission together with peace. And yesterday we heard from Sheikh Hussein that Islam also means I shall love all mankind. Wow, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. That was something good we learned, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah grant us all goodness and ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us engage in istighfar in the true sense. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us together again here or anywhere else in his obedience. And at the same time, may he unite us in Jannah the same way he has brought us here. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.